Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alfonso Montero, and the Chief Executive Officer of the uh, European uh, Social Network. And I would like to welcome you all to this um, webinar where we are going to be addressing the uh, situation uh, created with the invasion of Ukraine by Russia and the impact that this is having on the uh, numbers of people who are being forced to flee the country and to seek refuge in neighboring countries. We are aware that we've got over 65 uh, people registered, so we are slowly starting to allow uh, all the registrants to come in. So we are going to briefly start introducing this session and, uh, and, and the role of social services in situations of crisis, uh, of humanitarian crisis. And then after that, we will give the floor to our, to our speakers. Um, first of all, thank you very much, all of you, for being here with us. A couple of uh, practical considerations. If you look on the right-hand side uh, of your screen, you will see leaf transcripts and interpretation signs. This is because uh, our Romanian uh, colleagues will speak in Romanian, so you will have uh, interpretation. Make sure that you either follow in Romanian or please choose the English channel. Uh, you've got live transcripts, which means that actually you will be able to uh, follow the subtitles through the live transcripts. There is captioning, uh, and that means that you will be able to follow the text as well. So with this, I'd like again to, to thank you and to welcome you all for being with us this morning. Uh, the very distressful reports that we, we've read over the past month or so about the deaths of children following the Russian invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February have been over this, uh, over this week's a harsh reminder that civilians, particularly the most vulnerable, are the main victims of war. Many and more innocent lives will continue to be lost unless Russia's attacks are not halted. As representatives of public social services in Europe, the European Social Network wishes to underline our commitment to support public authorities and social services providers in Ukraine to help run their services in the best possible way in such a very difficult and such a challenging situation. We, of course, would like, first of all, to send a message of solidarity for everybody who is working in health and social services in Ukraine for their dedication and their hard work in keeping everybody safe and supporting the most vulnerable who are particularly affected by this conflict. For instance, older people and people with disabilities who have most difficulties to leave the country. Let me, however, say that the situation in Ukraine has actually been very difficult already for the past eight years since conflict broke out in the eastern Ukrainian regions of Donetsk and Luhansk in 2014. Towards the end of last year, there were almost 1.5 million internally displaced persons registered by the Ukrainian Ministry of Social Policy. There were no desegregating figures at the time, but there were uh, in the year 2015. And these figures are indicative of the type of persons who were displaced over 12% were children, over 4% people with disabilities, and 60% were receiving some type of pension. Therefore, we can say this was already a conflict in the making at the doorstep of Europe. A conflict we knew was somehow being crafted, but unfortunately, no, no specific action had yet been taken by the international community. Of course, with the invasion of Russia, forced displacement, displacement has increased significantly to the Western part of Ukraine, but also and very importantly, and this is what we are discussing here today, to neighboring countries. Of course, we don't know yet the scale of the displacement because this is gonna, gonna be based on a number of factors over the next, uh, over the next weeks. Uh, but what we, say, what we can say is that the number of Ukrainians internally and uh, internationally displaced by the fighting could be up to seven or even other estimates talk of 10 million. Before the invasion of Ukraine, uh, social services in the country were already struggling to support the hundreds of thousands of displaced persons, and they were not prepared for the increased levels of requests uh, for support following the hostilities. According to interviews with local NGOs, the most important needs are financial, for instance, employment, basic, like foods, uh, food and clothes, housing, whether permanent or temporary, and medical needs. Displaced families are forced to flee with a home um, 
without seasonal clothing and a regular income to an unknown place. And of course, the regions where all this started had already specific needs, which uh, had, been, had been there for a number of years. There are major challenges that persist in Ukraine's public uh, social services. And with the millions of displaced persons, public social services will have to deal with a number of issues related to post-traumatic experiences, psychological services, social and healthcare programs, employment support program combining both short and uh, long-term strategies. These involve a number of interventions around crisis interventions, outreach, mobile interventions, but also and very importantly, empowerment and social inclusion programs based in the community. In the border nations of Romania, Poland, Hungary, Moldova, Czech Republic, and Slovakia, the can and countries actually throughout Europe, private citizens, volunteers, and public social services have been welcoming and providing help to those whose lives have been torn by war. We will listen to the responses of public social services in three of these uh, countries. If we move on to the next slide, please. We will listen to experiences by Aurel Mokan, who is executive director at the Social and Health Director Services of the municipality of Kluch Napoca. Jiri Horechki, who is president of the Association of Social Care Providers in the Czech Republic, and Katarzyna Modrakowska, who is head of department at the regional government of Silesia at the Department of the European Social Fund in Poland. And we also have with us Ruth Passerman, who is director of the funds program and implementation in the European Commission. We also would like to have your, your input. There is the Q&A and the chat uh, functions that you can use throughout the session. With this, I'd like to give now the floor to Aurel, who is going to take us through some of the key issues uh, that you've been facing over the past four weeks and some of the key needs that you see in terms of investment to continue supporting the uh, hundreds of thousands of refugees that are arriving. Aurel, the word is yours. Thank you. Uh, sorry for, more, for my English. I speak in Romanian, OK? Okay. I Okay. Uh, you can uh, uh, you can start because we also have the slides, so that means that we can uh, you know we can pass the slides for you. So you you, you can start. Uh, it's visible my uh, presentation. Okay. Yes, it, everything is good. You can go ahead. We can see everything, and we've got the slides, so you you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, Sunt directorul Direcției de Asistență Socială și Medicală de la nivelul municipiului Cluj-Napoca. Uh, regret că engleza mea nu este performantă ca să fac față la o discuție în engleză, dar uh, sper să ne onorăm de obligațiile și sarcine care cad în sarcina noastră în această perioadă foarte dificilă. Uh, ca și structură, uh, suntem o organizație care acționează în două zone, și pe zona serviciilor sociale și în zona medicală. Zona medicală nu interesează acum și de aceea o să și trec peste acest aspect, pentru că, da, asigurăm asistența medicală în grădinițe, școli, licee și universități. Asta e o particularitate a noastră. Pe zona serviciilor sociale nu facem altceva decât toți ceilalți furnizori de servicii sociale, de la noi din țară sau din țările europene și parteneri pe care le avem. Practic, identificăm nevoile sociale, individuale, familiale și de grup și, sigur, încercăm prin politicile publice naționale și locale, și nu avem puține în zona asta, să intervenim, să îmbunătățim calitatea vieții acestor categorii de populație. Repetu, traducere vorbesc prea repede? Uh, 
Ok. Încerc să mă duc la slide-ul celălalt. Tehnica M nu mă ajută întotdeauna. Ok. Uh, 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 okay. Aurel, we, we can see we can see the slides. Aurel, you you can speak and we and you request that we pass the slide and we are doing this for you. So it's fine. You can speak. We can pass the slide. Okay. Uh, la nivel uh, local s-a constituit uh, la inițiativa primăriei un uh, grup de lucru al societății civile uh, în care au uh, aderat ca parteneri o grămadă de ONG-uri, persoane fizice și juridice, sub egida un singur Cluj. Grupul s-a instituit la începutul perioadei de pandemie, iar acum, pe fondul crizei din Ucraina, s-a reactivat cu dedicație specială pentru a oferi sprijin persoanelor refugiate din Ucraina sau suport și sprijin în Ucraina, cu transporturi de ajutoare acolo. Pe lângă acest palier al societății civile, vine zona guvernamentală prin Ministerul de Interne, care intervine organizat cu suport financiar pentru categoriile de populație aflată în refugiu. În următoarea ședință a Consiliului Local al Municipului Cluj Apoca, urmează să se aloce suport financiar pentru câteva orașe din Moldova și din Ucraina care au nevoie de sprijin în această perioadă foarte dificilă. Acest context ne obligă și pe noi să ne adaptăm la nevoile care apar în comunitatea noastră. Ne fiind de zona noastră una de graniță, momentan presiunea nu este foarte mare, dar apar situații care ne obligă să ne adaptăm dimers intervențiile noastre. Atât în a asigura și a sprijini cu locuri de muncă cei care apelează la serviciile noastre, vorbim despre refugia asta, de a informa, de a-i ajuta în a obține anumite beneficii sociale pe care le putem acorda la această oră, un efort deosebit de nevoie de copiilor care au nevoie de educație în continuare, acces la servicii de sănătate și de locuire. Avem o parteneriat vechi cu un ONG de la nivel local, prin care am învățat oarecum alfabetul muncii cu refugiații și acest fapt nu ne prinde descoperiți la momentul actual în a nu avea un minim instrumentar de acțiune în această zonă. E un câștig al nostru instituțional în zona asta. Și vorbim de organizația LADO, da? care acționează aici la noi, în municipiu. În concret, guvernul a venit și vine permanent cu adaptarea legislației în funcție de nevoile identificate. Astăzi, da, e posibil ca cetățenii, persoane fizice care găzduiesc refugiați să poată obține sprijin financiar din partea guvernului prin serviciile prin, municipi, prin primării. Și în cadrul primărilor, cei asupra cărora se focusează acest efort sunt serviciile sociale. Da? Deci noi vom acționa și vom sprijini aceste familii în a-și obține resursele financiare prin filierul guvernamental. Această acțiune este structurată prin Ministerul de Interne și 
structurile sale din teritoriu, inspectoratele pentru situații de urgență. Provocările la care am fost supuși și pe care le vom înfrunta în continuare țin de adaptare la aceste nevoi ale persoanelor care vin. Bariera lingvistică încercăm să o depășim prin colaborare cu Facultatea de Litere din cadrul Universității babeș boiei din municipiul cluj napoca Depășind aceste bariere, chiar am reușit să traducem formularistica necesară, adică lista actelor necesare pentru a accesa anumite beneficii sau servicii sociale la nivelul municipiului cluj napoca Aici vorbim de beneficii care se suportă atât de în bugetul de stat, dar și din bugetul local, prin politicile sociale la nivel local aprobate prin hotărâri ale Consiliului Local al Municipiului Cluj și Napoca. Lucruri de multe ar fi de spus în zona asta, dar Experiența de până acum și ce întrevedem noi ca provocare mare e că într-un viitor nu foarte îndepărtat va trebui să uh, creăm un departament dedicat acestei categorii de populație. Uh, până a apărea problema refugiaților din Ucraina, noi aveam uh, în evidență doar trei uh, cazuri de familii de persoane refugiate din alte zone care... Uh, erau în evidențele noastre cu anumite uh, servicii și beneficii. Uh, momentul actual ne uh, obligă să ne resetăm un pic și să ne adaptăm din mers la uh, nevoile care apar și în funcție de volumul de muncă uh, impus de aceste realități. Uh, preventiv, guvernul a aprobat, uh, printr-o hotărâre, uh, facilitatea ca noi, autoritățile locale, să putem angaja asistenți sociali, în plus, pe lângă, fără concurs, tocmai pentru a avea o procedură rapidă, pentru a face față acestui val de probleme care ne obligă la adaptare din mers. Vă mulțumesc! Thank you very much, uh, Aurel, for this introduction to the situation in, in, in Cluj and some of the, the work that you've done to set up, uh, to set up actually a new league, basically a new service altogether because of, of, of the lack of that type of, uh, of, uh, of group, you, you say, no, you say that the large challenge, the larger challenge was precisely to be able to set up a group that would take care of, of, of people coming because you did not have the experience of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of refugees coming in such numbers to the city of uh, Kluch Napoca. There was a question, whether you actually, this is an initiative taken only by the city of Cluj Napoca or whether there are other cities uh, that are taking the same initiative through or under the umbrella of a national program. And I want to ask you as well, actually, whether, regardless of whether this is or not a national program, what is the coordination between cities uh, in Romania, if there is any? Uh, uh, in the province of society civil, ea se organizează independent și acționează uh, în funcție de cât e ea de activă pe zone, pe regiuni, orașe. La nivel uh, guvernamental, Ministerul de Interne coordonează uh, acest, să zicem, programele de sprijin pentru uh, Ucraina și prin structurile locale județene uh, asigură implementarea acestor măsuri în fiecare județ uh, din România. Uh, prin Inspectoratul pentru situații de urgență din fiecare județ, care are coordonarea și resursa financiară pentru intervenție și sprijin. Clujul, raportat la celelalte orașe, e un particular pentru că aici societatea civilă este foarte activă, dinamică și oarecum uh, incomodă, să zicem, pentru autoritățile publice locale pentru că le obligă să nu fie doar reactive, ci și proactive. Și asta este o explicație de ce Cluj-Napoca este unul din orașele de top din uh, România în ceea ce privește dezvoltarea uh, sub toate aspectele sale. 
mai ales că aici, da, este și un mediu universitar uh, foarte activ, cu 10 universități, cu aproape 100 de mii de studenți. Nu știu dacă am răspuns. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe so. I believe that uh, there is also the, the national program of the Ministry of, of Interior. We can also see, we can move on now to other countries to see as to whether in other countries the, the, the way that the, the, you know, the work you reflected in includes is also uh, reflected in other countries. Uh, if we move on uh, to the next uh, to the next slides, uh, we are now going to give the floor to uh, Giri who is the president of the Association of Social Care Providers in the Czech Republic, and he can take us to some of the, of the similar issues, really, that you have been facing over the past uh, four and a half weeks. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, some of the, some of the things that you see uh, coming up in the next, uh, in the next uh, months and where you see also the needs for, for future investment. Uh, Giri, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alfonso. Uh, I'm going to present in four slides uh, what is the situation in the Czech Republic, what actions are being taken and what are the biggest challenges and issues uh, uh, nowadays and what we are, are we expecting for the next weeks and months to come. Next slide, please. So um, Czech Republic has accepted uh, now more than 300,000 refugees uh, from Ukraine. Uh, usually the maximum absorption capacity, not only in the Czech Republic, but um, in all the countries, uh, is uh, between 2 and 2.5% and of, uh, of uh, refugees or, or, or of foreign people coming and entering the country according to the uh, housing uh, capacities and also according to the capacities of public services generally that are there for, uh, for inhabitants of the country and for the uh, um, refugees coming. So. We have exceeded this uh, absorption capacity. We know that we have allowed 10,000s of uh, accommodation capacities, and then we uh, we would have to open accommodation in exercise halls and in sign of uh, towns uh, of, of stands. And we don't want to because uh, we also know that uh, uh, the structure of people coming is over 50% are children and uh, over 80% of adults are women. So uh, we don't want to have them in, in, in at schools uh, sleeping uh, on, on, on some uh, mattresses, but we are seeking to uh, provide them uh, a good accommodation uh, with the fact that uh, those are vulnerable groups uh, are coming and entering Czech Republic. So the main issues uh, are uh, housing capacities, adequate housing capacities. We are also trying to uh, to motivate uh, uh, private families, uh, private owners of, uh, of um, hotels, of uh, um, tourism uh, um, accommodation capacities to accommodate uh, uh, those people coming. Uh, uh, but uh, we are at the top now. Uh, and uh, also some of the capacities are uh, awakened only for the next two or three months. So if um, uh, this number will is going to grow, or being stay stable, uh, this uh, will be uh, also a problem uh, for the future. Another issue is schools and kindergarten capacity. So having said that uh, more than 50% of, of the refugees are children, uh, uh, we need and we are going to need uh, uh, kindergartens, uh, children's groups and schools uh, capacities. Uh, the other issues that is related to them, that uh, not all of the children uh, can prove their vaccination. I'm not talking about COVID vaccination, I'm talking about measles and, and smallpox and other things. Uh, and according to the Czech law, we cannot accept them uh, in the kindergartens uh, and uh, in the children's group unless they have uh, uh, this uh, vaccination. So, um, and we all realized that they had maybe a couple of minutes or hours to, to, to flee and go away. So they didn't take all, all these things. So we are ready also to start uh, the re-vaccination for children so that they could enter uh, this uh, uh, this uh, preschool uh, facilities. Uh, Long-term care issues is uh, also integrating at work and, and school, uh, not only at preschool institutions, but mainly in basic school and secondary school and universities, which is connected also with the language barriers uh, that uh, is there, even though it's a Slavic uh, uh, language and it's uh, pretty um, easy and doesn't take that long to, to learn the basics of the language, it still is the barrier in the future to, uh, to challenge. 
And then uh, uh, the, the full integration in the next uh, amounts is estimated by the Czech government for 3 billion uh, uh, euros. As for now, for, for today, uh, we have already uh, given over 1, million, uh, 1 billion euros uh, for all the costs that is related with uh, uh, integrating and accepting uh, the refugees. Next slide. So what uh, uh, is the situation? Uh, what uh, services are provided for uh, the refugees from Ukraine? They get a special visa within 30 days. Uh, they uh, get the monthly benefit of 200 euros. This benefit is, uh, this money is only to pay uh, food and uh, some, some basic uh, stuff. Uh, they uh, get free entry to do all the labor market. Uh, and uh, actually this is also a, an occasion for or the Czech Republic because you know that uh, we have had the lowest uh, uh, unemployment rate in Europe for the last uh, 10 years. So in the Czech Republic currently there are 300,000 vacancies uh, and uh, uh, so many of them are also suitable, especially in services, but also in healthcare and social care are suitable for the for the Ukraine women uh, that uh, are coming to the Czech Republic. So they have they they have no entry, do not no uh, barriers. They have a free entry to the labor market, and uh, uh, while working in preschool uh, institutions and in social services. Uh, we have issued a special law, it's called Lex Europe Ukraine. According to the law, they don't have to uh, meet the uh, qualification requirements. So the um, refugees from Ukraine can immediately start working in all the social services or priest institutions without having to prove uh, uh, that they have the requirements that are normally required from the, from the domestic uh, Czech uh, uh, workers. Then uh, there are payments for accommodation for everyone that uh, offers accommodation, like the private entity. They get 10 euros uh, for a day and a person uh, for the accommodation to cover the costs. In some regions, uh, it's 15 euros because also the regions are, are uh, um, contributing to that. And they have been uh, payments approved for Czech households. So if a private family accommodate uh, someone from Ukraine, there is uh, uh, an amount 480 euros um, uh, uh, payment, a 480 euros amount for that. They have also free access to kindergarten schools with the limit uh, of uh, vaccination. And they have also, according to this Lex Ukraine, free uh, access to social services, not only care, but also social prevention. So if they need nursing home, home care, daily care, if, can, if they need also meals on wheels, uh, uh, if they need some intervention, uh, something that is also uh, also uh, being paid from the Czech uh, care recipients or social services recipients, uh, for the Ukrainians, it's uh, free of charge. And uh, we are going to introduce a special uh, a subvention program uh, to re refund or compensate all these costs uh, or the provision free of charge to the social services uh, providers. In the future, we are anticipating that more needs of social services uh, will be uh, required. There are not so many people with the disabilities or uh, older people, seniors, uh, elderly requiring care. Uh, um, it's um, uh, mainly in Prague and in, in, in the big cities. Uh, there are uh, already some nursing homes that are being uh, moved or transferred with all the clients and also all the staff to the Czech Republic. Uh, and this is also the case of Slovakia. But uh, um, at the first migration wave, it was not the case. And we uh, are counting that maybe on the second uh, uh, migration wave, there will be more all elderly people or people with disabilities coming, which will require strengthening uh, uh, the social services capacity in, this, in the Czech Republic. Next slide. So what, uh, what is, are the priorities and the challenges uh, um, in, in the Czech Republic? What, one of the things that we also are, are facing is uh, that uh, uh, the work migration stopped from Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. Uh, work migration that uh, we, uh, uh, we um, uh, were counting on very, uh, uh, very often uh, because of the low uh, um, unemployment rate in the Czech Republic. Uh, before the conflict, uh, there were on daily basis a lot of coming or migrating a lot of people from Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia to work in the market that has stopped and is causing us also some, some, some problems uh, because uh, the people that are coming are not suitable for every work position in the labor market. 
uh, there is a, a also a risk that uh, we are uh, we are aware of of um, uh, of uh, the lack of solidarity nowadays the wave of solidarity is very huge uh, people are donoring people are helping uh, people are uh, uh, you know supporting all uh, on the refugees but uh, they are also starting some uh, some some rumors and uh, some uh, criticism uh, that uh, uh, the refugees shouldn't be prioritized uh, uh, before the Czech or prior the Czech citizens, and we are also talking about it that we should be we should talk about all these things um, because the risk uh, that uh, it will take the other way around at some point uh, is uh, is high and we uh, it's not there uh, but uh, the risk is there and we have to be aware, aware of it. Problems with vaccination is uh, it, it's about children. I already mentioned that poor health status is also one things that they are we are dealing with. You, you know the. The number of people of coming from Ukraine uh, having uh, tuberculosis, hepatitis, uh, uh, HIV is much more uh, or higher than in the Czech Republic. And uh, uh, before they uh, enter the facilities, the labor market, they have to go through the medical inspection and we have to be aware of that. Um, especially with uh, uh, with uh, the tuberculosis, because uh, we are not vaccinated tuberculosis anymore since the last eight years, because it, it it was it was vanished in the Czech Republic. It's it's not here, and now it's here uh, again through that. So it's uh, also health issues that we are uh, facing. Uh, we have quotes in the Czech Republic, so we have 14 regions. Every region has quotes, and also the big all the cities or the bigger cities have quotes. So, if, for example, I am living um, in in the city of Tabor with 36 inhabitants and they have to accept 500 refugees so every city has some number and they have to find the accommodation for accommodation and housing for them and the other problem is uh, a lack of uh, gps and pediatricians uh, so I, I mentioned it's more, more most of them are children uh, they are also having some some health issues and uh, uh, before that our capacities of pediatricians were not to worry sufficient were at the edge and with the czech republic and now it's also a problem. The last slide, please. So uh, um, uh, the resource and funding, I mentioned that uh, the, the costs that we have uh, been facing so far are 1 billion euros. Uh, we are counting on the three more billion euros uh, uh, to invest. That's why Czech Republic also asked uh, the European Commission, European Union uh, for a contribution. Uh, we uh, are not accepting to, to pay uh, all of that because it's uh, it's our responsibility to, 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 to bear the costs. We are, we are just... Uh, or we're asking to, to contribute to uh, all the uh, costs that are related uh, with the crisis. And also the cost, the cost is mainly to uh, secure uh, healthcare through the GPs and pediatricians to uh, build new capacities of social services, of education, preschool education, and uh, the care for uh, for children. So uh, and also uh, for uh, for um, uh, tools at the la labor market uh, uh, situation to uh, offer uh, new jobs to learn them the language uh, uh, quickly and to help them integrate. Uh, 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 as fast um, as, as as possible. So that's uh, the situation in the Czech Republic. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jiri, uh, for taking us through the situation in the Czech Republic. There is a couple of questions uh, from uh, from uh, from the audience which I'd like to convey to you. But if you allow me um, to ask a question, one of the key things, uh, I mean, as early as the twin, the, the the very beginning of uh, of March. Um, when uh, when uh, I, I went, as it happened, I went to Barcelona to speak in the World Mobile Congress and I was interviewed by the press. Uh, the, the main questions was about the waves of refugees from Ukraine coming into the, uh, into the countries. And one of the things that I said is one of the key differences between the previous waves of refugees and this one is that most of the refugees are going to be uh, women with uh, children. So mothers with children, and therefore social services will need to prepare for this. I mean, you gave data, which I would like to just uh, recall if this is correct, whether you talked about 50% of the uh, refugees were children and 80% of adults were women. I mean, this means that really social services will somehow have to prepare for this. This is a, a new situation, different from the other, other waves where we were talking about unaccompanied children, but we were talking about young men mostly coming from uh, from you know countries outside Europe. How did you see this? Is this something that has been discussed 
um, in the framework of the numbers of refugees coming into the into the Czech Republic. Uh, yes, the, this is the main priority, and, and the Czech Minister for Labour and Social Affairs uh, is going to prepare three subvention programs. One is to extend social work at municipalities, because we know that social workers and social work will be also needed in this situation, so they are going to pay more money to have more social workers and to, to, to strengthen social work at municipalities. They are introducing a, a subvention program for NGOs that are uh, providing uh, the Ukraines with information because they need someone uh, that is coordinating uh, their life here, uh, uh, their lives here. And there is uh, uh, the subvention program for social services providers that uh, is going to cover all the costs related to uh, providing uh, the capacities uh, to Ukraine uh, refugees. Well, money is one thing, but we also need human resources. We also need uh, caregivers. We also need social workers to provide all that. And uh, this is something that we are uh, uh, slightly afraid of. Uh, you know, uh, once they enter the country, the first days they tried to uh, have accommodation, they had accommodation, it was uh, the first day, so now most of the uh, mothers are providing care of the children, and now they are, they are starting to ask for work, because they, do want work, they want work, they want to make a living, they, want, uh, they don't want just to sit at home, so uh, we expect and anticipate that in the next weeks, there will be a, a much higher demand for preschool uh, education, for for children's care and also to, for services that are linked with uh, integrating it at the labor market. Uh, so this is something that uh, we also have to, um, to, to enlarge the capacities to, to, to uh, strengthen capacities of home care services is not that, um, not that uh, problematic because we can employ those people and they can start working right away. But uh, to extend uh, beds in nursing homes or um, places in kindergartens and preschool institution, this is a problem because we have also uh, check um, legal regulation and uh, we cannot extend the number of kids per class, for example. Mm. I, I, I wanted to, I mean, very briefly to, to, to come up on, on something that you, you mentioned, because there was a question there and then we passed on to, uh, on to Katashina, but a question which is very important because you said that uh, they can work uh, in, in social care, uh, in child care without qualifications. There was a question around how they are safeguarded against issues such as being underpaid or exploited in the workplace, that's one. But also my question is, does this extend to child protection? Because we are talking about very vulnerable people, you know, when it comes to uh, staff, uh, they need to check against many things, you know, uh, because we are safeguarding vulnerable people in the first place. I wonder what safeguarding measures are in place for this. So about, about the wages or salaries conditions, they are the same as for the Czech uh, employees. So uh, they will, they must uh, get the same uh, payments where, when they are employed by a public provider. Uh, it's the same, it's uh, according to the, to, the, to, to the law. When they are at a private provider, uh, we have eight groups of minimum wage and they will get the fourth group of minimum wage. So they will get the same condition that uh, Czech employees. Uh, and also the trade unions are keeping an eye on that. So uh, um, that's, that's, that's all right, I think. Uh, about uh, no qualification, uh, first of all, the, the main priority is that uh, the Ukraine uh, women will uh, providing the care for Ukraine uh, seniors, people with disabilities and children. So that's the, that's the main approach uh, uh, because, uh, because of the language uh, barrier. And uh, the other thing is that uh, we always uh, in social services have uh, some other uh, qualifications like nurses, practical nurses, social services, and this, uh, um, this um, uh, uh, I would say a liberation of uh, qualification requirements is only for the basic caregivers, not for the other professions. Uh, for the other professions, it's not possible to, uh, to enter and start to doing that without qualification. Yeah, that, that, I, I just wanted to double check this. There were a couple of questions for you, I, but we need to go on to the, on to, on to Katarzyna. If that's okay, I'll keep those questions, but we'll ask you uh, later. But we'll move on now to, uh, to Katarzyna to take us through exactly the same. Um, tell us about the situation in Silesia in, in, in Poland. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you please move to the first, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank you for coming today. Uh, let me start 
by uh, introducing myself. My name is Katarzyna Modrakowska and I'm working in European Social Fund Department. Uh, and on a daily basis, I'm working with, with distributing donation in the field of social inclusion. On behalf of Marshall Office of the Salesian Voivodeship, I would like to share our experience in helping refugees from Ukraine in our region. I would also like to emphasize how emo emotionally devastating is the situation is for all of us uh, and how difficult it is to deal with the scale of the consequen consequences of this conflict. Let's have a look for some statistics. Please move to the next, thank you. Over two and a half million refugees crossed the Polish border. 400,000 personal identifiers were given to refugees in Poland. This is the access to official benefits in Poland, such as health, work, social, uh, social service. As of 27th of March this year, there were 1,000 empty free unemployed and job seekers of Ukraine citizens registered in regional labor offices. Over 99% are women. Over, over 14,000 children in region are already enrolled in schools. We are very willing to help and the residents of our region have shown a lot of support by organize, organizing different activities to help refugees from Ukraine. Situation is serious and we need systemic assistance calculated and organized. We need to take action as a local government uh, so the health would, would be a long term and stable, not only based on work of volunteers. Uh, please, the next slide. So far, we've managed to organize, for example, Team for Assistance to Refugees operating under the Marshall Office, collection of necessary found material, materials, drugs in the office, Support of the employees speaking Russian and Ukrainian to government services of, on hotlines. At information points, for example, at the railway station in Katowice, bilingual portal, which is a simple free access contact base for searching for places in the Salesian Voivodeship for people, for people coming from uh, Ukraine. For example, rooms, maybe not apartments, but just rooms. The database is dedicated only to private individuals and is not for commercial use. Child care activities, of course, free tickets uh, for Ukrainian citizens and special um, train runs to the, the border. All these uh, activities are financed from the resources of the Salesian Voivodeship. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, we, also, we also planning to allocate funds under the European Social Fund to help refugees. We are waiting, we are working on at least two projects. Uh, one is about active integration and the other one is about uh, social and uh, health uh, service. Uh, and our department is also working on releasing the savings resulting from the implementation of the regional operation program of the Salesian Voivodeship and of obtaining additional funds to help migrants from Ukraine in connection with the war. These options will be soon discussed with the European Commission and uh, with uh, hoping that they will be accepted. Um, next slide, please. Hmm. At this stage, we already identified a number of problems that must be solved to make the help uh, be effective and long term. Apart from the obvious problems, I would like to draw your attention to issues related to virus tests and vaccination against COVID-19, consolidation and verification, if vaccination or vaccinations of children under 18 are up to date. Situation of children. Some of the children who came to Poland, approximately 1800, do not come with a legal, legal guardian, but a temporary one. 
places to stay, finding long-term accommodation for people coming from Ukraine will be a long-term challenge. Currently, a significant number of them have found free shelter in a private apartment. This is uh, obviously a temporary situation. Personally, I am also hosting a Ukrainian family. And, uh, uh, and I know that the best option for them is to live separately without fear that, 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 they, um, that they will have to live. And they have, uh, the, I have uh, uh, the mother and two kids. The mother is already working in a, in a labor, uh, in a, a lab, um, laboratory, laboratory, laboratory as a chemist. She was a chemist in uh, Ukraine and she, she is a chemist uh, now. So it's a quite good job for her, um, good for her qualification. And the boys are going to school already. And when I ask her, are you, quite all right with the situation, I, uh, how you feel with this situation, she said to me, I want to go home. I'm waiting to go home. So uh, it's, it's very touchable and it's very hard to, even, even our help is, is not enough, is not enough for, for them. Although we hope that the war is soon over, and please the next slide. And here is, here is the list of activities that have to be done in the medium and long-term perspective. It's important to increase the availability of childcare places, increasing women's professional and so social activity, including social inclusion and psychological assistant activities, organization of care facilities within an in this institution, institutional for foster care, uh, for example, orphanage, parent type care for children from Ukraine, orphanages and uh, foster families. Uh, care and health activities for elderly and disabled people coming from Ukraine. This, uh, as we know, the situation is still dynamic uh, so it is difficult to plan activities and financial resources intended to help refugees. We ex expect support in solving problems together with the European Union members and working out methods of help as well as financing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Katarzyna, for this, uh, for this uh, overview of the situation. I wanted to... Um, to very briefly highlight some of the key things that you mentioned around the 800 number of children who come without a legal guardian. It's, it's, it's extremely, extremely important to this because it's about how are we taking care of these children. But you also mentioned a number of, of a very similar, um, similar uh, situations to the one that was mentioned by you in relation to children and access to kindergartens for children then the question of children not having the right types of, of vaccine or not, or being unclear as to what their health status is. Um, and, uh, and also the looking into the future, which is not very long, actually, <laughs> it's very close, the future of taking care for uh, older people and people with disabilities. I believe that those are very serious considerations that we ought to look at as social services. There was a question in relation to the, the, the managing of the cost for telephone and the operators. I wonder if you can very, very briefly refer to this. There was a question from the chat. How did you manage the telephone cost? How did you manage the telephone cost agreement um, with operator? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure uh, about the question, telephone cost agreement with operator. It was for me a question because I didn't mention about this. 
<laughs> maybe then there was a, we will wait just to see whether uh, Marika ya may, maybe explain because she maybe. said that. Maybe for everybody, if you uh, ask a question, please be clear as to who the question is for, and then we can address it. No problem at all. Let's, it's just, it came like this. I thought it was in relation to your to your presentation. So we'll wait to see as the weather. And then for now, in the meantime, we will move on to, to ask uh, Ruth uh, what her observations are based on the, um, on the three presentations from our colleagues from Romania, the Czech Republic, and uh, Poland. And then hopefully we'll have a couple of minutes also for final uh, final comments and questions afterwards. Ruth, the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> my name is Ruth Passam and I'm a director at DG Employment of the European Commission dealing with, uh, with the funds and notably the European Social Fund. Um, I, I, I think uh, I, I want to thank all of you very much for this, which is it's always very interesting for us to know what is exactly happening on the ground and uh, to have the real concrete practical experience. Um, we don't have um, uh, yeah, we don't have, uh, we, I mean, me and my colleagues have direct contacts with all the managing authorities like the one that Kazajina is from on, uh, on the ground, but this is an unprecedented, I mean, we have to be clear, huh? this is an unprecedented uh, mass movement of population the pre or, or at the speed which is uh, really uh, unseen, for, I mean, it's much, much faster than even 2015 from Syria, which was already very fast. So, um, uh, so, this is, so of course, there are lots of things. I think also we have to recognize the enormous generosity of people uh, in Europe, uh, notably in the border countries, in the border regions, but uh, because at the end, like all of you said, mo there, is, there have been lots of donations. There's lots of people that have opened their houses, and this is the only way to, to solve this in the immediate uh, because of this extremely fast situation. Now, what we have done, uh, also extremely fast, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know if you know, the commission tends to be very slow to solve problems, but here, I think we were quite fast. We um, activated the cohesion funds. Now, the cohesion funds are usually uh, financed under programming period 2014-2020, and then the new one, 2021-2027. De facto, because of the of the other crisis, <laughs> the pandemic, uh, the, the, the 21, 27 funds are quite delayed, but there are still margins in the 2020, 14, 2020 uh, and, um, envelope, uh, including the sort of top up that was given for the pandemic, so, so called React EU. And we have now activated uh, what we have said is that basically every money that is still unspent, I mean, making it very simple, every money that is still unspent in the social fund or in the regional development fund or in the fund for the most deprived, FEAD, it was mentioned, I see some of the questions, um, can be used to integrate Ukrainian refugees. Uh, including the money from the RDF, because it can be transferred, uh, it can be used uh, within the RDF, it's possible basically to create a new priority, which is called uh, support to Ukrainian refugees, and also all that can be used. All expenditures from the 24th of February, the date of the invasion, can be uh, considered. Uh, and therefore, um, so basically, what we we know that there have been already a lot of expenditures. Uh, this proposal that was made by the Commission, it was agreed, uh, it was being agreed by the co-legislators with Parliament and the Council, and normally should come into force next week. But as I said, date of eligibility is from the 24th of February. And anything uh, the, we will all be very flexible on making sure that all the kind of expenditures can fit fit into. This, uh, this, uh, I think we've, we have now, we, you can find on our website a list of all the kind of expenditures that can be covered uh, from this uh, CARE, so called initiative, CARE, um, co um, Cohesion Action for Refugees, is the acronym. Uh, the, the, um, there are indeed two phases at least uh, in, in the sense there is the first phase which is clearly the just the, the entrance you know the uh, how do you say the accueil uh, you know the the welcoming of refugees at the first moment uh, uh, food the shelter uh, in the first uh, 24 48 hours uh, but then indeed you need there is a second phase which is more linked to 
um, finding a job, finding a school, finding a house. Now, on this uh, issue, I think, first of all, it's very important that the Commission, and the Member States, not so much the Commission, has activated so-called the Temporary Protection Directive, which means that Ukrainians are entitled to work and to social benefits exactly like European citizens for um, from day one, from the moment they're registered. So actually, I was quite impressed by the numbers of Poland that they have 2.5 million people, but only 1 million registered, uh, if I'm not wrong. So that, that I, I, that's actually an issue, <laughs> uh, because the, the, the registration is what opens the doors to the, you know, act being available for the labor market, etc. Now, uh, I didn't have, I had very much on my radar screen, the issue uh, of uh, child, child care, integration into schools, integration education. I mean, 50% of those coming at children. So it's a top priority that they are, uh, I mean, it's also for them that they don't lose, you know, schooling that they are. Uh, so this is really, an, uh, was clearly also my, my priority. And there are various solutions being used in different countries. I mean, depending, of course, on the also on the sheer numbers. I mean, in some cases, integrating into normal school into schools, like you were saying, uh, for Slavic languages is similar. So the of course it's a different language, but it's uh, it's uh, perhaps easier to do. Um, there are also countries which are organizing Ukrainian classes with you with where the Ukrainian refugees are basically giving the schooling. Uh, the women. So uh, this is also another possibility. Of course, a temporary situation is not a situation for the long term, but it's a good initial situation. Um, so this is clearly a very important issue. Uh, another issue which was very much on my radar screen, although I think less of my colleagues uh, in the Commission so far, uh, is this issue of housing. Uh, because now everyone has been, uh, there's been an enormous uh, uh, um, generosity in all countries to host refugees, but everyone is doing it with the idea that it is temporary. I mean, no one wants, uh, you know, uh, wants someone to live in their house forever. And of course, well, the Ukrainians don't want to live in their house forever. I mean, they want to be independent and they don't want to be guests. So. Uh, th but this is really an issue because it takes a long time to have new stock of housing. I mean, it's really, uh, in my opinion, much longer time to actually have new stock of housing than, than um, or to find, you know, housing solutions which are appropriate compared to um, services, which are also difficult, but it can be done quicker, in my opinion. And then the other point which I uh, wanted to mention, uh, which uh, actually was completely out of my uh, radar screen, is this issue of vaccination uh, and in general, the health uh, issue, which including the staff, which was mentioned, I think, by the Czech colleague, the, the fact that you don't have enough uh, GPs or pediatricians to take care of this enormous influx of children was, on the other hand, very much on our radar screen, the issue of unaccompanied minors. Uh, this is something on which we are, uh, we are mobilizing and, me, and not only us at European level, I mean, all the work is being done on the ground by the colleagues and the, in the regional level, but you know, to provide information for every, to, to, to provide information, to talk with the authorities. Um, the commission has, uh, last year, I think, has adopted this child guarantee. So there has been, which has allowed the nomination of national coordinators for the child guarantee. So we have been contacting them to look also how we can look at the issue of uh, unaccompanied minors. And of course, it's very important to, to keep track of them and to register them and to ensure that they are safe also, because there's also, of course, the unfortunately issues of trafficking of, um, of children. So, um yeah scale i mentioned um yeah uh that's um yeah i think i mentioned everything that i wanted to mention uh in reply i mean some of the comments that were made i'm available for questions i think uh, we are also at our level to um uh making the most trying to do what we can and to once now that we have the legal framework on the money, on how uh, the, on the money, uh, the list of eligible actions, which, as I said, are practically everything uh, that can be done. I think, uh, except 
building new houses actually <laughs> uh, and uh, um, and then uh, so now we're going to we are my colleagues are going to engage bilaterally with all the uh, countries and uh, on and, and therefore also I think there is a question on this point too where I would be interested is how much is done at national level and how much is actually done at regional level because my impression is that most of the action so far is much more regional than and, and rather than the, the national level which our our initial interlocutors. Okay, I stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth, for, for giving us some specific examples of uh, uh, initiatives that can actually help, you know, social services on the ground to support uh, refugees. You talked about at least two phases or two stages, probably more than that, certainly welcoming of refugees as the first one, you know, the, the beginning of it. Uh, second phase of finding the accommodation, covering all basic needs. Um, and then of course we move on to a third phase, some of the key things we were discussing already around supporting, no? supporting uh, some, some, some sort of social inclusion, at least temporarily for the time that uh, those refugees are there. I think uh, it's, it's so important. You did refer to uh, the uh, cohesion action for refugees care, or also the possibility of using some of the RDIF uh, lines as well, specifically for, uh, for providing support. I think those are examples of how funds, European funds can then be used on the ground to create uh, an impact where the, where the impact is actually uh, provided. I think uh, it's, it's very important that colleagues know about this. Now, there are some questions there. I can see that a number of those a number of those uh, of those uh, things have already been addressed. I would like to maybe ask uh, our uh, our colleagues from Romania, Czech Republic, and Poland. How did you feel about some of the initiatives presented by the European Commission? Were you aware of them? You feel that they are in the right direction? Is there anything else? Because of course, this is an opportunity also for Ruth to know a little bit more about the issues you are facing. Is there anything else that uh, you would uh, you know you would like to suggest? Uh, that is taken into consideration, particularly around some of the uh, uh, very, you know, the very immediate future needs that you refer to, some of them that were not on the radar also, uh, Ruth referred to that, they were not on the radar. So um, maybe I start with, uh, with uh, Katashina to, and then we move on to Giri and Orel. Uh, um, yes, uh, uh, a lot of words with uh, said my uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, we have the same uh, observation and the same feeling and the same problem. And the the, the most important uh, thing is that we don't have diagnosis. What the people will, will do if they will stay for a longer time or they will they will move somewhere? We organizing some help, uh, as I said, from. Uh, European Social uh, Fund, for example, but we don't know what will happen in a few months. Well, we don't know if they will stay here or um, hopefully the war will uh, end. And uh, um, I, I felt like this is my colleagues from, from the next room, not from the different country. We, we, I, I feel that uh, we, we have the same problems. I'm very curious what we do with the houses, with the housing. So housing is one of the key issues that you have identified. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that the same for, for yourself, Jiri and Jiri maybe now and Orel, or are there any other things that you would like to then highlight for, for, for Ruth? Yeah, maybe maybe two things. One thing is that even though we don't we don't know about uh, the problems, uh, uh, for example, with pediatricians and GPs, we also know there is uh, no solution for that because there are there are no reserves. Uh, we can use uh, some uh, uh, women doctors coming from Ukraine, uh, identify them and um, and uh, help them. So that's um, uh, that's one thing. The the other thing is that uh, we are also discussing whether. It should be better to um, to organize the groups of Ukrainian children in kindergartens and school, or it will be better to integrate them among Czech children and not to have special uh, Ukraine classes. This is also an issue, and we we are currently preferring to have them uh, in the ordinary class with Czech students with some assistant that could speak both languages. The, we have also, uh, like in Poland, the, the Ukraine minority is uh, pretty pretty high, so there are a lot, a lot of people speaking both languages uh, that are working here and helping uh, their people. And the last thing is, uh, 
but that's more a problem of the managing authorities. Uh, sometimes or, or often it's, it's, it's hard to access a European funding uh, uh, and the reaction uh, takes some time before the managing authorities, especially for the Czech Republic, uh, open some, some, some program from uh, ERDF uh, or uh, at ES, ESF plus, we are in the middle of two periods now. So we know that uh, those actions, when they decide now, the money could be used in a couple of months. And uh, we are in a situation that is changing from week to week and uh, uh, the, the need for support, so for some sort of support for the social services providers, NGO sector is there right now. The Czech government is, is reacting to that. The Czech government is supporting us and try to, to pay that from our Czech uh, 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 budget. But uh, we know that, uh, and, and once again, maybe it's a problem for probably our managing, managing authorities that they're, they're, they are not that fast at actions uh, uh, when, when, it, when, it go, when it's about the European uh, uh, funding. Thank you for that, Jerry. I wonder, now we pass the floor to Aurel, who is also with uh, Carmen, who is the head of the Department of Social Protection. Aurel, maybe you can tell us, what's your perception as well? I mean, some of the key things uh, that have been mentioned at European level by Ruth, some of the, the key initiatives, also at national level, how do you feel whether the EU funds are coming or are you aware of this? What's your feeling there? Okay. Um, parte. Jiri și Catarina au răspuns la problematica noastră în a accesa fonduri europene, adică este mare greu sistemul birocratic în a, în a ajunge sursa financiară la cei care efectiv implementează proiectele și valabil și în zona aceasta. Mai ales că acum nu este într-un proces în mișcare și greu putem stabili niște jaloane ferme pentru a asigura integrarea mai ales a copilor în școli. Fiindcă e o provocare mare aici. Fiindcă adulții, în mare parte, își mai găsesc locuri de muncă, mai ales în zonele în care e nevoie de forță de muncă. Dar integrarea copiilor în structurile de învățământ din fiecare țară sunt provocări care nu se pot face doar cu autoritățile publice locale, că aici e nevoie și de o coparticipare a resurselor didactice care transformă din Ucraina spre țările în care se refugiază. Cred că aici trebuie găsit un modus vivendi prin care să facem reale aceste eforturi de integrare a copilor în structurile de învățământ. Adică cei adulții se pot integra mult mai ușor. Problema este în mare parte a copilor. Iar zona celorlalți cu nevoi speciale, vârstnici sau persoane cu diabetes, da, există reglementări legale și la nivelul uh, României, doar că resursele de absorpție a acestor persoane în unitățile de asistență socială sunt foarte limitate, pentru că la ora actuală nu avem suficiente locuri nici pentru ne uh, problemele reale ale noastre ca țară. Sigur, este o provocare și sursa a fi, da, fondurile europene care se pot fi valorificate în zona aceasta. Mă opresc, fiindcă să lăsăm și lui Carmen să-și spună ea din experiența ea trăită la graniță cu refugiații. Mulțumesc! Mulțumesc foarte mult, da, am fost la graniță, nu știu dacă asta ar fi întrebarea către mine în momentul ăsta. Dacă mi-ați permite, fac asta, deci vă spun despre ceea ce... Uh, am întâmplat uh, my wonderful experience and that awful experience. Uh, I, am, uh, am fost uh, instruiți uh, într-un program regulat de ISU, de Inspectoratul pentru Situații de Urgență, uh, și am beneficiat de un instructaj din partea Anei Regulescu. Este președintele Federației Internaționale a Asistenților Sociali. Trebuie să mărturisesc că eu am spus despre mine că știu ceva meserie și știu ce înseamnă intervenție în criză, dar am avut nevoie de uh, instruire specială pentru intervenții în caz de dezastre. Um, am fost împreună cu studenți din Universitatea Ștefan cel Mare Suceava, este o universitate de, de, foarte aproape de graniță. Um, experiența noastră pe de o parte a fost o confirmare a faptului că în situații de criză ai nevoie de 
ochi în toate direcțiile și în toate părțile și ai nevoie de suport din partea tuturor entităților pe care le poți implica, în același timp ai nevoie să gestionezi resursele în așa fel încât să-ți ajungă un interval de timp lung, dacă se poate. Am avut foarte mare grijă, deci noi am fost într-o primă fază a practicii noastre, a voluntariatului nostru, chiar în tabăra de la Siret, în tabăra de refugiați. Ulterior, când a scăzut presiunea de pe tabără, am fost în campuri, acolo unde refugiații sunt adăpostiți pe termen mai lung. Și aici fac o paranteză, da, a scăzut presiunea de pe graniță și a început să crească pe serviciile sociale din România și cu certitudine din Polonia, din Cehia, absolut de peste tot, atunci când acea directivă europeană a intrat în vigoare și anume oamenii au putut să intre fără ca neapărat să aibă actele perfectate. Da, în România acum își pot face permis de ședere temporară, ceea ce înseamnă că au drepturi ca și oricare cetățean al României. Ce a fost important pentru noi să gestionăm nevoi imediate? Nu mai e timp să faci întâi evaluare și apoi intervenții, cum știm noi, că e un proces de asistare socială. Am făcut evaluare și intervenție și în condiții deosebit de grele, pentru că bariera de limbă a fost una înfiorător de greu de de depășit. Am avut din nou parte de suport din partea studenților ucrainieni de la Universitatea Suceava, studenților din Republica Moldova, pur și simplu a cetățenilor care au știutor de ucrainiană, care au venit să ne ajute. Și aici, dacă îmi permiteți, aș mai face o mențiune care ține tot de intervenția în caz de dezastre. A trebuit să potolim entuziasmul celor care vroiau să ajute pentru că nu eram siguri că intențiile lor erau dintre cele mai oneste și permiteți-mi ca între colegi să vă spun că m-am temut mai tare de trafic de persoane decât de bombe și am fost cu ochii, ne-am și instruit studenții și voluntarii să fim cu ochii în 17, să nu scape nimeni, mai ales persoane foarte tinere, în mâinile unor oameni despre care noi nu știam multe și atunci ieșirile din tabără au fost foarte atent monitorizate. Deci cei care au preluat ucrainieni în difer, diverse moduri uh, au fost uh, legitimați și știm, spre exemplu, acum de unde să luăm cetățeanul și familia X. Ce uh, am învățat acolo să răspundem unor nevoi emoționale neexprimate și vreau să vă spun că eu mă aștept ca pe termen lung să explodeze probleme la care acum nu ne gândim și dau dreptate domnului director din Cehia, vor urma și mai multe murmure din partea cetățenilor, din partea majoritarilor. Noi știm, când apare într-o familie, știu eu, un copil cu nevoi speciale sau doar un alt copil, un alt membru al familiei, dacă nu ești atent la această reechilibrare a rolurilor, reașezare a resurselor, s-ar putea să existe probleme și entuziasmul, adrenalina, boostul ăsta de energie s-ar putea să scadă pentru că oamenii vor fi atenți la nevoile lor care sunt și ele acolo și ar trebui să ținem cont de, de toate. Ce a fost uh, important pentru noi și dacă ar fi să fie, aș spune oricând, uh, am uh, stat împotriva tentației naturale oarecum. Uh, copiii uh, mai vorbeau engleză și atunci aveam uh, imediat să vorbim cu ei și să îi întrebăm pe ei despre și aici am zis, nu întrebăm nimic despre. Cu copiii ne jucăm, pe copii îi ținem eventual în, într-o asociație, într-un cort în care cineva să joacă cu ei. Am uh, refuzat categoric și ne-am și făcut auziți 
în raport cu autoritățile statului ca acești copii niciodată să nu fie folosiți ca translator. Niciodată. Niciodată. Și niciodată... Carmen, I, Carmen, we need to come to a little a close because we are getting close to the, to the end. We have for single on 75 minutes. So I, I, but I wanted to highlight something that you mentioned earlier on, which is uh, you said, if I understood correctly, you said that the, the pressure and the borders is, has now gone down. We, so we said earlier on something around the different stages of the process, the beginning as the welcoming element on the one hand, and now you were saying, but now this pressure has moved on to social services. And this is something that we should highlight because in the different, uh, in the different stages of the process and the different forms of support, we are now moving into this social services, uh, uh, you know, key forms of support. And this is where we will need to see as to how uh, different forms of funds can help. There was a question for, for Ruth around, and I think the answer is no, but maybe Ruth, you can confirm whether there is an overview of new funds available for the municipalities you know, directly. And obviously, I think I answered, but, <laughs> but Ruth, please, I give you the floor. <laughs> well, to be honest, the money in general is actually at regional level. The, the, the regional programs is not that, uh, so the, 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 the cohesion uh, funds are distributed at regional level. Now, the point is that, of course, now in the current uh, uh, or, uh, situation, it may make sense at national level to redistribute some of the funds. So, and, and in that sense, we think it's important that there is some kind of national coordination. If there isn't, the money is actually at regional level. And the, the, the flexibilization is all right, is actable. I mean, what can be done at national level, at regional level. So if there is extra money on a re, in a region, which was uh, planned, uh, I don't know, for uh, for a research center, perhaps it's not the, anymore the situation to do the research center. And it is uh, the case to use it for these expand emergency expenditures that have happened now or, or, and are happening on Ukraine. If I may just mention two things though on this, there is a risk, and it is. I, I completely take this point. You are redirecting money which was planned for something else, and uh, the risk uh, that uh, that the local population is not very happy about it at some point will will arrive. I mean, for the moment there is a um, a lot of solidarity, but at some point this will be. Um, you know, there is a line between you know taking care for our own people as well as taking care for 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 the Ukrainians. Uh, that uh, that I think I am very aware and I think most of the speakers also are aware of this risk. Uh, so that's one point I wanted uh, to make. And then <clears throat> uh, on another issue uh, or, which I forgot to mention before is that uh, it is very we are also working on the recognitions of the qualifications of uh, Ukrainian uh, of Ukrainian qualifications. So basically to ensure that there is uh, you know a mapping basically of how Ukraine how Ukrainian qualifications match European ones. Uh, there isn't a mapping already for the European ones, even though they're different, so, so that uh, this should also help because indeed a lot of the things that we're mentioning could be done actually by the Ukrainian women that are coming in if they had the right qualification. So there is this aspect also of finding out what they can do. And the example that uh, Katya Regina gave of her host is, is, a, is a very heartwarming one, but it's not, uh, I'm sure it's not the, so, the situation, the normal, let's say, situation so far. So, okay, I stop there, sorry. No, but this was very good, Ruth, because actually the question, the way you answer the question, actually is to tell uh, our members and to tell those working locally that sometimes the money is even closer than they think it is. <laughs> it's actually not that far. It actually, as you rightly say, is in many places when it comes to, uh, to cohesion is at regional level. Therefore, they are quite close to that. I think that sometimes there is a lack of understanding of where the different, you know, the different levels and where they sit. And this is why it's so important, these meetings where this uh, type of information can be provided. I would like also to highlight something, if you allow me, and then with this we will start closing. Uh, how uh, what Carmen mentioned, no? the, the question of solidarity and how solidarity is is managed. You know, in times like this, when people mobilize, the risk for other people to capitalize on the pain of families can be quite high and can become higher when there are many people involved without, their, without having appropriate coordination and about lack of knowledge, no? who does what. And certainly this is a very serious issue when it comes to uh, separated uh, child refugees. Uh, in the absence of any family support, of course, there are very serious concerns for children's safety because they can be subject to violence and to human trafficking. But also something I'd like to say that for 
any success when it comes to uh, welcoming refugees is about helping them integrate into the local communities, which is what pretty much most of uh, which pretty much most of the presentations of our speakers refer to, and these in a way cannot just only be done by, uh, by, 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 by members, by uh, social services working on the ground. It does require some form of national coordination no? with, uh, with national governments, uh, uh, working with local authorities to put in place the appropriate social inclusion plan, which you know, can put in place all the resources to support the professionals, to have the professionals in place, and uh, to have the housing that we mentioned, to have the appropriate financing, to help children go to school, to have resources in their own language. And of course, this involves also a medium to learn to long-term approach, uh, which of course is, is not that easy because as uh, Katashina mentioned, it's also the question of whether they want to stay and whether they will stay. So it is a very difficult and complex uh, situation what we have uh, uh, in front of our eyes, really. And social services have responded over many decades to the human tragedies that follow conflict. And certainly this uh, military invasion of Ukraine is, is resulting in large scale displacements of people for which social services are, of course, supporting in the best possible way they can. But certainly this is a serious uh, challenge that we will need to see as to how unfold over the next uh, over the next months. I, I'm aware that it's already 12.25. I'm gonna close here, but I would like to thank you all for your time. And I would like to uh, remind you that we will look into this. We are gonna be looking into this in the European Social Services Conference, which is taking place in uh, Hamburg in the beginning of June. Uh, initially looking at the, the recovery from COVID, uh, well, obviously, uh, we are looking at much more than just COVID, the crisis, uh, the Ukrainian crisis, of course, impacts, as we have seen in the resilience of uh, social services. And of course, we continue also to celebrate how social services are working in the best possible way to support the most um, vulnerable in our communities and our awards, the, the ones for 2021 are being uh, handed over in a ceremony tomorrow. And uh, we would like to thank you all for, for, for your support. And we will be for sure looking into the issue of uh, uh, Ukrainian refugees and the impact on social services over the next months, hopefully with another, with another webinar like this one, of course, at our conference in Hamburg too. Thank you very much and look forward to being in touch very soon. All the very best and uh, uh, see you soon. Thank you, have a nice day. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you to all the speakers. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.